all right back in business uh three minutes two minutes late uh, three minutes late my apologies welcome back <laughs> thank you i had to quickly eat something and because we didn't have lunch i had to actually quickly create do it myself so yeah broke your record <laughs> all right so uh um <laughs> funny thing everybody says yes without me asking a question but yeah i just wanted to say shall we continue and people are saying yes so shall we continue i love the uh, fact that the poll went out and people said yes i could have said would you like to fail the semester <laughs> yes. we read your mind we knew what you were gonna ask us <laughs> all right uh and uh, the other half i guess they're not still at the computer Professor, I actually was wondering something. Yes. Um, in the first semester, we had some really cool messages in our ticketing program that we had to do in BTP 100. So I was I was wondering if you had anything to do with that. Or... What cool messages? Uh, well, in the ticketing program, it was Men in Black themed. I don't. You know, know. the movie with Will Smith and the aliens. I don't know. And... I no. I'm I'm usually Star Wars, Star Trek or ah, Dr. I Seuss see. type of fan. So you see my stuff usually, like right now, I think the workshop number one is phone number of Star Wars characters. So, oh yeah, it yeah. is. It so, is. <laughs> so yeah, so no, I don't think so. I didn't do anything BTV 100. Probably that, that should be Cornell if he, if he was teaching it or someone. <laughs> Man in Black, good, I do that. I like the movie. I'm gonna go find out the character names. That, the that was project. pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh that's that let's uh continue uh structured programming so unlike over here going through logic the very first thing that we need to know about c language the big big hoopla about c with c language that c language um helps us uh to kind of organize our our thoughts <clears throat> how does it do that uh when we are doing programming at any moment of time uh, it's like any other task that you are doing and you cannot look at the whole picture all at once because you're really going to get confused. Anything you go, give an example. I want to bake a cake. You could look at the cake with all this amazing stuff, icing and everything going through it. If you look at it, it seems impossible. But when you break it down into pieces, this is how you do the pineapple. This is how you make the chocolate syrup for inside of it or cream or something and this is how you do the sponge cake and then you put it you cut it in slices then you put the slices together and you cut a rounding then you do the icing then you add the icing then you do the decoration so building that cake <clears throat> when it's done into modules it becomes easier you go this is how you do the chocolate syrup so you add this and that so you, you get you give specific uh, uh, instructions to build pieces and parts of one thing and out at the end when they're all done you never start from a cake first and then do the layers and then do the icing that's impossible you do pieces of the cake first and then you put them all together and then you have a cake that's how you build things all the time uh, do we understand this but you can write the instructions of <clears throat> building a cake as going through point forming what is needed to be done without even knowing how it's supposed to be done so a person who's experienced in building a, when i say building a cake it sounds programming baking a cake the person who's experienced when they ask them how a cake is done you it's going to tell you okay first you have to create the make the cake then you have to do the um, uh, i don't know uh, creams and stuff between the layers then you have to make the icing ready and then after that <clears throat> you have to cut the cake then you have to put the layers then you have to put the cakes the layers of the cake to, on each other then you have to do the ice so what happens is that they can point form everything at the beginning and then be done with it so <clears throat> that's why so what they make the c program for matched you were saying um, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I was saying so these instructions for creating a cake uh, basically translate into pseudocode for creating a program. Yeah, but the person who's who is uh, uh, 
experienced in C programming, not a novice person, a person who's experienced and knows what's going on, they can actually say over here, uh, prepare cake, pre prepare sponge cake, sponge cake, sponge cake, then, then that, and, and go through it step by step and write the steps first without actually doing uh, the steps. So the person who is less experienced knows how the sequence of things done. Kind of write a wish list before it's done. Okay. That's what okay, I wanted yeah. to tell you. Like in programming, because everything's happening inside your brain, <clears throat> to actually put things together, they made functions. So C language is based on functions. And to not a not surprisingly, the 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 main thing that is supposed to be done is a function that is called main. And anything else to you do, all the pieces that you want to do, not to get confused and you want to do it separately, you put on there in the functions of their own. And if I want to make the cake, although making a cake is uh, uh, <coughs> um, a process that is done, but when you are actually uh, thinking about it, this process of making a cake uh, returns a sponge cake. I don't even know how to write a sponge. <clears throat> is this how you write sponge? Is that correct, people? Anybody? I think so. Anyway, I don't know. <clears throat> if it's not, That's sorry. Great. I've never. Um, English is my fourth language, and I just know how to do programming. If you tell me write the grocery list, I'm going to go crazy. But anyway. Well, so that's that's right. Trust me. I've been, I've been a chef for 20 years. <laughs> so, so, that's, there that's right. so, so there you go. So a sponge cake is going to make a cake, okay? And it's going to need uh, milk, uh, M. It's going to this amount of milk. Then it's going to need egg this amount of eggs and then it needs um i don't know a little bit of salt this amount of salt so each function in c language receives the ingredients and returns what it's supposed to make so this is how it's designed okay so all the functions in c language are written like this it received they receive ingredient they return the outcome so there is no other way around it. Of course, we can kind of fake it and do stuff in here, but that's how functions in C language in C language work. They receive ingredients, they return outcome. Okay? This is in the world of computers. So if I have the computer rolled in here, so the guts of my computer, if this is these this actually is the guts of my computer. The functions are there. And these functions interact with each, with each other, getting values from each other and returning values to the one that is calling. So a, a function can receive values from many different places and returns one value out. This is happening inside the computer world. So we don't have that human being standing over there yet. So I know I'm, I'm standing over here and say this is the human being that is standing over there watching the world outside and this is his eye or her eye. <laughs> oh God, I suck at I think. So this is the person who's watching over there and this is the nose and this is the <laughs> man. Oh, I'm kind of a Picasso. <laughs> Anyway, so this is the world outside of the computer. This is inside the computer. So what happens inside the computer is happening with these all these functions. To communicate with world outside, it has nothing to do to receive anything with a function or return anything function. Ingredients coming to a function come from other functions. Ingredients returned from function go to other functions. If you actually, let me remove this <laughs> disgraceful thing that I have written over here. So, so I'm going to change it like this. So the human being standing over here. So this is the human being. And this is the neck and the two hands and the two legs. That's better. Okay. So this, to actually interact with world outside, we cannot use, <coughs> we cannot use the, 
the func the the values the ingredients that are passed to a function or anything that is passed outside so the things that go into a function it comes from other functions the thing that it returns it goes to other functions it's the functions that are interacting now if I want to bring something from outside then I have to have specific actions happening and they put all those actions that it's supposed to communicate with outside of the program in a standard input output header file and they gave you the functions to do it so they are functions written that get information from outside a function called scanf it it communicates with the with the keyboard with the console receives the information from outside and gives it back to the program and there is printf that receives the values from the program and prints it on a screen so printing st stuff on a screen and receiving stuff from the keyboard and console, it has nothing to do with arguments that are received into a function or returned from a function. Uh, are we okay with this? All right, so that's essentially what C programming is. A program that is functions that call each other functions and the main function starts everything and the program is written by an experienced person who can tell to <clears throat> to Vinny to write the program that does the, to write the function that does that, that could, tells Abdullah to do this tells Alex to do that tell Arsalamanda to do that tells Osama to do this and all those programmers who write the pro functions they test the functions called using testers and stuff like that and they say for that we're done I write the main calling those functions and my program is done. This is called structured programming, with I, which I create the structure of the actions that are supposed to be done and I build my program based on it and that becomes the whole story of writing C programs. Are we okay with this? All right, so now that we know that, so it is, so what the, when they say we want to send something back through the argument list, that never happens. It's a trick that you make, okay? It's a trick that you make. You never can pass anything back from argument list of a, of a function. Stuff from arguments list of a function is always sent to a function, and a function is only capable of returning one thing. You're going to tell me, so how come scanf can, can read five things at the same time? Scanf and give it back to us. Scanf is not giving back anything to us through its argument list. We are giving the address of places that we want Scanf to put the things in. So we are giving the Scanf the address of where I, where I want the things to be. Scanf blindly puts the value in those addresses. Because those addresses belong to us, we see the values are set in those addresses. Scanf does not return three values. Scanf actually only returns one value that I'm going to tell you what it is. <clears throat> but the things that it reads, we give the address to Scanf. Scanf puts the value inside the addresses that we gave to it, and therefore we have it. It's as if you tell to your brother, take that plate and put it on my desk. You didn't, your... Uh, brother did not return a desk to you. You told your brother where your desk is so he can put the plate on the desk and when you go to the desk, you see the plate is there. He did not return the plate to you. He put the plate on the desk, you picked it up from the desk. That's not returning. Returning is only one in a function and it returns from the back of the function, whatever it returns. Are we okay with this? Knowing that, let's talk, so I just wanted to put that out of the way so we know what it is, what functions are and how they work, and now we're going to go through all the <coughs> structure programming thing with logic and things. So, essentially, <coughs> when you are writing sequences for the actions to be done, you say 1, do this, 2, do that, 3, do this, 4, this is, 5, do that, and you're done. That's sequence. That's essential as the line of the line of the programs we are writing. One, do this, two, do this, three, and four, do that. <coughs> but what happens, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, uh, one, mix the egg with the flour, and it's wrong to do it this way, but I'm going to mix the egg with the flour <coughs> and the milk and beat it until 
uh, it foams up, for example. It doesn't, but I'm just giving you something, okay? So now I ask you to repeat something. That's iteration. So I'm not saying one, do this. I'm going to say mix this and that and that. So I give you some stuff. Then I told you, keep doing something and check for a condition until everything, until the condition appears. And soon as the condition appears, stop. <clears throat> That's iteration. The things that we do and we keep repeating over and over and over and over and over and over and over. Okay. <clears throat> then I'm going to say, <clears throat> then I'm going to say, if you have cocoa powder, you can use cocoa powder for making a cake. If you don't have cocoa powder, you can use chocolate. So if cocoa powder, use cocoa powder. Otherwise, you can use chocolate. So this is not repetition. You have two selections. And while I'm saying we want to say chocolate cake, there are, our objective is, is it that you come to one condition, one of these statements. And in that statement, I'm going to say, these are the two choices. See which one is true. See if this is true. Do this. Otherwise, do that. That becomes selection. So you do between selection and you continue doing things. And having all this, these three things, sequentially being able to do this, make selection based on criteria and repetition, we're all done. We can do anything we want. Are we okay with this? And why we are doing this, why the heck we are actually programming. The thing is that, I'm sorry to mention this, but let's as assume um, these days you have to really be careful what you're saying not to offend anyone, and I want to do that. Um, uh, say you want to perform it, I want to repair a car, okay? And I have someone that has no idea what mechanics is like well how does it do and there is a recall on a car and there are 5,000 engines that are supposed to be done and be over with and given back to customers so I have 5,000 in engines to repair I have two people I have one person that is extremely intelligent knows exactly how to build an engine perfectly and I have another person who has no idea how an engine is built but he can build the, an engine in three seconds in three seconds now which now, one is the best thing to cho choose choose a person who knows exactly how to do the engine or hire the person who doesn't know anything, know anything but, after but after learning he can do it in three seconds and i have to mute abdullah, abdullah because i can abdullah hear myself from abdullah's computer Abdullah, mute yourself. Mute yourself. Uh, I found you. I'm going to mute you. Okay, there you go. So, so my question is, and I want you to, to answer it. So, which one I do? The expert, it's in this scenario, it is better. So, the expert can fix an engine, knows how to do it, but it takes him five hours to do it. So, I have 5,000 computers, 5,000 multiplied by five hours. That's the time it's going to take. I have a person that it... I have to spend 50 hours to teach him how to build an engine, but he can do an engine after learning in five seconds only. Which one I, it's better for me to uh, choose, the expert one or not non-expert one? Which one I should hire? The second one, the non-expert one. Expert one is wrong. Whoever says pick up the expert, that's wrong. Because that expert person is going to spend five hours multiplied by 5,000. That is 25,000 hours of work. But the person who takes 50 hours and it takes five seconds only, I spent 50 hours to teach him how to do the engine. Then it's going to spend 5,000 multiplied by five seconds. That is 10,000 seconds to fix all the cars. So it is always better 
to try hard to teach the person who is who cannot do the thing properly but is faster to do the things and that's computer programming computer is the dumbest thing ever you have to go through every single detail of the work to make it work properly but if it does it properly it is thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of times faster than us therefore it is better to deal with the computer do we understand why do we need to program So, the most important rule in programming, the most important rule in programming that it mentions it over here and many of you for some reason don't use it when you are doing programming is one point of entry and one point of exit in every single function that you create. So any package of information, sequential things that you want to put, you should come in from one place and go out from one place, which means having more than one return statement in a function is a big no-no. You should never do that. And don't ask me why. It's just just don't okay trust me on that when you are writing a function if you are supposed to have two return statements over there it means there's two places to go out you are doing it wrong write an if statement and oh make it only one return statement okay that's the most important thing one point of entry one point of exit always 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 okay Pseudocoding, flowcharting, pseudocoding is pretty good. You write down what you want to do in a pseudocode, not to bother with the syntax of the program, and then you write the program for it. But when you become an ex expert in a language after a while, you write the pseudocode in the language's way, and therefore it shortens your thing. When you can actually think in C, it's quicker to write a pseudocode, unless you want to uh, communicate with many people from many different languages. So you are doing pseudocode. First, you have to have your variables and stuff. So we're going to go through them. Uh, I, I, flow charting and everything. These are not the things that we want. This you want to go through the details of the language and conditional stuff. So uh, any problem with the if statement? You want me to talk about it? Say yes if you want me to talk about it. No. So we know what if statement is and how it works. <clears throat> Um, well, Professor, I have a question M might be related to the if statement, mm -hmm. if that's OK. okay. Um, well, OK, so it's about the switch statement. That's I switch. personally I'll talk about switch. <laughs> when yeah, it comes to like... time, I'll talk about it. So don't don't ask. OK, OK, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. OK, yeah. so the only thing about if statement that you might not know is that if I say if A in here, uh, one, two, tell me which one happens. One or two one person said two if you said two to this if you said two to this it means you don't understand what a condition is and what is true and false is in C language we have to review that anything other than zero is true anything other than zero is true Zero is false when you put an, in an if statement, you put a condition because condition is 10, 10 is non-zero, it's true, therefore one happens. Okay, remember that. Two only happens when A is false. The only thing that is false, false is only zero. Everything else is true remember that so if you do not have a condition and you only have a value that is supposed to be checked for truth or falsehood it is always 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 false uh, true unless it's zero everything is true unless zero that is false remember so i have a question uh, what if a is a, neg a negative number is that also count as non-zero right what is this of course <laughs> All right, that answered your question. Everything else, okay? Everything else, it doesn't have matter if it's negative 10 or it's positive 10 or it's a float number 0.001212. Doesn't matter. Anything other than zero, any value other than zero is true, okay? Remember that. Okay, so let's have that one. What else? So that's if statement. And if statement obviously has 
uh, many different features. You have if, if you want to have one selection out of many, one selection out of many, uh, one or no selection out of many, it's else if, and else if. So this construct here that you see is one or no selection out of many. So depending on what the condition is, that selection is going to happen out of many. If you want to have one of many, then it is exactly the same thing, but at the end it ends with an else which means one of these are going to happen. It's one of many, it's one or no selection out of many, which means it, neither of these may happen. This one happens, at least one of them. It, one of them is going to happen, no matter what the condition is. And that's if statement. Are we okay with this? All right. Okay, <clears throat> so that's if statement. Another alternative for if statement is switch. Switch statement works like uh, uh, the second one that I that I wrote over here. So uh, switch state actually switch statement could be any of these. So the diff the the if statement you can check any condition over here I can check if a is greater than 2 and the second one is going to be B less than 5 and this one is going to be str 0 being equal to a so it doesn't matter what the conditions are as long as the conditions are met that's what you're going to do so the conditions in an if and else if station they have nothing to do with each other but in a switch statement, the difference is, in switch statement, first of all, it is always checked for equality. So switch statement, switch, always equality. You cannot check to see if something greater than something or not. That cannot be done. So you write switch, and in that switch, you write your... Uh, condition whatever it is so in here uh, not the, the value so it's going to be a value over here and in here you're going to have case and in here you have uh so in this is going to be variable sorry and in here you're going to have value break value break value and break so so this is how variable so this is how it happens it checks the variable if so I'm gonna say value 1 value 2 value 3 and it can go as many as you want okay the equivalent for this switch statement in if statement is like this so in here I'm gonna call var because I'm lazy and in here I'm gonna call val because I'm lazy so if you want to write the if statement uh, compared to this one it's gonna be like this so if var is equal to val1 this is actually case first case case val1 okay else if var is val2 else if var is val3 and else so essentially what happens over here this is what happens in case val2 this is what happens in case val3 and this is the default okay so 
So when you write something like this, anything between these two is going to happen if var has this value. Now, you can do something else too, for example. You can actually say if case is val2 and you write the second case over here and I'm going to put val2.1, okay? So I have one value over here and I have the second or two underline one. So I want to compare it against two values. The, uh, exa the, the example in a C statement will be like this. If I say or var is equal to val2 underline 1. So this case is this if statement. They are identical. The difference, I think, is the answer to what Majd wanted to ask. Was it Majd who was asking the switch? Um, uh, yeah, Which I just... Um, um, no, that wasn't what I was going to ask. Okay. I was going to ask if, if, if there's going to be a situation where we have to use the switch, because I personally would prefer to use if-else statements. Your, so uh, you prefer, personally, your program to be a slower than everyone else? Oh. The reason. I'll tell you the reason. Okay. These are jump statements, which means switch statement when you put it like this. If the value is a match without condition, it jumps to that one and continues the execution. Correct? Yeah. In here, if the last one is a match, first this is checked. If it doesn't happen, then second condition is checked. Then it doesn't happen, then the third condition is checked, then it's going to come here. Which means all these have to get executed before this can actually get accomplished. So it'll be much slower. Much slower. That's why we have oh. a switch. Switch is much faster because it's a quick jump. And by the way, this is the only place place break is permitted. Only place. Oh, you know that break can be used somewhere else. You're not allowed to use it ever, ever. 40 years ago, we abandoned that because it was inefficient. 40 years ago. If you use break anywhere other than this, it means it's a huge no-no. Only switch statements. So switch case break is essentially a pack. You never use break anywhere else. And if you don't know where to use it, you're a good person. Okay? So that's a switch statement. If I want to have my switch statement, okay? If I want to have my switch statement to be one or none of many, which is going to be like this. Switch one or none. Okay, then you don't put a default. It's as if you don't put an else over here, which means it's very possible that none of them happens. Okay, so that's that. Are we okay with the switch statement? Oh, I, I keep putting, asking you to type, but it's okay. You can type every day, every now and then. <laughs> You're very welcome, Sandy. And somebody's thanking me for some reason for this act, but it's okay. <laughs> All right, so there we go. So we are good. Uh, so we know what switch statement is. I'm going to go back here. So switch statement. So 14 switch. Again, this is a review. I cannot... Uh, and I do not want to teach you programming because that's something that's going to take a long time. It is impossible for me to r start writing you code right now and tell you this is how it's coded and that's how it's coded. This is a review on concept. For programming, you have to practice. There is no way that I can, in, in a review session, I teach you how to program. I can teach you what the tools are. After you're done with this, go write five few programs of your own and you're going to uh, learn how to do it. Okay? Keep that in mind. So, uh, so that's that. Now, okay, sir, I just had a question uh, one more time. Um, so, you said in the in the switch case scenario um, on the top there, you can have val two as a case and val two underscore one so as a case. You don't put a break between them, which means if it matches this one, it continues after this, and it's done. So it's just an yeah, it's just an or. Okay, I guess it's just okay. an or. So you are just simply using the fact that. It's a sequential thing with breaks halfway through when you're using okay. that. There's nothing special about it. But if you want to do it in an if statement, then it's one of these two. So that this changes to a condition. Okay? All right. So now we have that. Uh, 
Um, uh, let's go to talked about all these case by case yada, yada, yada. oh there is a shorthand if statement that is a very quick if statement that you can use in C language let me just do switch over I'll switch I've done so whenever you have a situation that you have two actions happening based on a condition that creates the same result okay so let's say I have int foo over here and int fa so I have two functions and these two functions they both generate integers you see that if I want to write something like this int res and arrest if condition whatever the condition is then I want to say res is set to foo otherwise res is set to fa whenever I want to write such a thing there is a much quicker much faster execution and at the same time shorthand version of writing it and that is to write res is set to condition and then question mark foo column fa and semicolon so these two are equivalent they are the same thing this is hundreds of times faster but if you had a double over here you couldn't do it anymore these two must be from same type this is not an if statement it is being uh, translated into binary language in a completely different way and the fact that they are both of the same type makes the execution faster so you cannot have two different types over there they must be of same type so foo and fa say and this could be anything you can have something like this um, integer a b and C you can simply say a is set to some condition and then uh, B and C which means essentially the translation of this will be if condition a is B otherwise a is C okay and this is a very fast way of doing it you can actually put this thing as uh, even passing value of a thing so if I want to have something like void over here get result and it's got to get the result from me integer result over here if I have something like this I could simply say over here get result and insert the condition in here instead of writing it in a separate way and it makes everything quick and nice and beautiful I don't need to set anything so this literally says pass this one as a condition or that one to get result and so on and so forth so this is called a conditional expression are we okay with conditional expression sorry I didn't follow the rust uh, function pardon me uh, I I didn't follow the Rust con uh, function that is get result. You don't under you didn't understand this. Is that what you said? Yeah. No. No. Yeah. So let's say you want to pass the result of your condition to a function. So I want to do this. I want to say void. I want to get the result and do something based on it. This you understand, right? Do you understand line fifteen? yes yes so you want to pass the result to the condition so instead of creating a separate variable to do that you can simply put the condition the the conditional expression right in there as an argument so you can say get res and instead of that remember I told you when you learn the programming expand from it because these two are the same you can either put this one or that one so I can just take this and put this one instead okay so I didn't even need to create an integer res in here. Okay. You follow what I'm saying? So essentially, I guess, I, I think. yeah, so this is C, like this is very usual. A C programmer does this all the time. They don't want to waste time. They say get the result based on the condition pass foo. If the condition was false, pass fa. They don't want to write five lines, five, five, five lines of code. In one line, they do it and they're done with it. This is very normal in C. 
it, this is not one of those confusing things. Very normal in C. And obviously C++. Okay? This is not a confusing thing. We need to understand this. Conditional expression is a quick way of uh, getting the result and pass it through. Okay. Uh, are we good, Azusa? Yes. Perfect. Why it's keeping me the line endings are yada yada yes, sure. This is really funny because I've never done anything, added anything in here, but it's Visual Studio is creating something bad and it tries to fix it itself. <laughs> anyway, so conditional expressions, iterations. So you only need to know one way to repeat something and everything else re actually translates in that. So repetition is this. While some condition do something. This is the loop, the, the only iteration the C++ language has. C language has, not C++. This is the only iteration C, lang C language has and absolutely no difference with anything else. So integer A, now I can say over here, let's say A, and I'm going to put over here 20. Um, and in here I'm going to say while A is greater than 0, now I'm going to say printf uh, a like that, percent d, and I'm going to go to new line. I'm going to put a in here. See, now I can do a minus minus. It means I can do it after the semicolon. So I don't need to write the second line over here a uh, minus minus. I don't need to do that. When I do after it means first print a and then reduce it by one. So if I run this program obviously I'm gonna have the 20 things printed. Or actually let me make it easier. So instead of that I'm gonna make it comma separated and do a new line after or space separated and do a new line after. So printf or put char new line so I'll go to new line like this so let's run it like this so I can uh, keep changing it okay so as you see 20 to 1 is printed and it means while this condition is met keep going and printing that out are we okay with this which is very possible you see a C programmer don't bother writing equal than zero in here because C programmers know that zero is false it's very possible that if such a thing is there, a C programmer actually like writes this. Because the outcome is essentially the same. Oh, oh, oh the outcome is not going to be the same because it ha A has to get 20 over here. So if I set A to 20 again, the outcome will be exactly the same. It's going to stop because A b if A is non-zero, the condition is true. It's going to keep going until it hits zero. Are we okay with this? And why half of you don't respond to my poll? I see half of the class is not responding to my poll. If you are not listening to what I'm saying, you don't want to click on yes, then please get off the class. Okay, I hate to see half of the class not responding. That's not right. Uh, anyways, uh, it's as if half of the class say, I don't care what you're saying. So please respond to my poll. Anyways, so that's that. So this is wild statement and how it, this is how it works with absolutely no doubt and, and it's very simple and straightforward there is one thing that you need to know that while statements may never happen so if I actually bring let's bring this one here so if I actually bring this one over here and set let's say a to minus 20 this will never happen because the condition becomes zero so I'm gonna say this this will never happen this will not happen. Why? Because the while statement's condition goes false right from the beginning and if I run it the third statement's not gonna run and that's why. Are we okay with this? Alright, so now that we have done this we need to understand what is it. So why would I say the only thing that I need is a while statement and nothing but that. So let's see what I mean by that. So 16 over here. Okay. So now if I go over here, what is a for loop? 
for loop essentially means do this at the beginning check the condition and do this a third time so this so if I want a minus minus to happen I can just put and do this at the end so if I put this a minus minus here happen once first happens every time happens every time last that's a for loop ladies and gentlemen so essentially if I want to write that for loop let me just separate the a from things so we know what I'm talking about so if you want to translate that to a for statement it's for you put this one here and literally that's why it actually has semicolon because these are actually a statements then you write this one that is a condition and then you write what you want and then you want what you want to happen at the end and then you put the body so a for loop is essentially a quick way of writing a, a while loop exactly the same and then you put character at the end professor yes i have a question actually about the last time where in the printf you printed a minus minus mm -hmm. that actually just prints like the value subtracted right it doesn't actually change the value of a it changes or... it changes the value after after the pronoun. After the semicolon. If you remember, I told you when you have a minus, when you have minus, minus, or plus, plus, it happens after yeah. semicolon. So essentially, the translation of the C translation of this line, whoa, yeah, the, the C translation of this line is this. Are these two lines? Okay. It means first print A, after the semicolon, reduce A by one. Okay, okay. Are we good? I, I was just under the impression that like it in the printf statement, it didn't actually change the value. Oh, it does. Reason. That's why. That's yeah, how you okay. go down. Otherwise, how I, this wouldn't happen. <laughs> right, right, right. Are we good? Yeah. Thank you so much. No problem. So, so in here, I'm going to do A minus minus. <laughs> Mm, a minus equal one. I'm going to do it like this. So I can actually put this one here to make sure that it is exactly the same. So I'm going to put this one over here. Okay. So, and print it like that. And if I run it, you'll see that is uh, that I will get the exit. So I'm going to, mm, I'm going to comment that. So if I run this, run this, you'll see that I'm going to have, what happened? Oh, there you go. So it prints it like that. So to actually put it to extreme, when I had the other while statement, that was like this. Remember this? I can actually write the for loop like this. I can say for a is set to 20, a less greater than zero and in here i can literally pull the put the printf it doesn't matter as long as the statement is running i can put it there see no difference same set to two at 20 while it is greater than zero keep doing this and i'll put a semicolon at the end and that's why they created because it's just faster oh. what is a 20 at the end uh. What is the, what are, oh, did I do, oh, this is the one, I think, we didn't need this one, so, I need to put this, uh, copy, paste, paste, I forgot to go to new line, there you go, so there you go, so they are, they are exactly the same, so that's how, what a for loop is, and if you have five things to initial, so this is only one, you got to put a one condition, in here you can put 50 things separated by comma so in here i can i can do like this too i can i can say uh what do i say um uh, mm, um what do i do um i'll put uh pff, i don't know um I'm, i can say over here put care say um a greater than thingy and just separate it with comma, which means these two things are going to happen. And if I run it, you'll see everything has a 
thing afterwards so it doesn't matter you can put several things in here and separate it with a comma several several in a set of several settings or commands at the beginning it doesn't make any difference beginning so this again this happens only once at the beginning this happens many times uh, at the end and this check gets checked every single time I'm gonna remove this that was just letting you know that that you could do that okay so let's run it one more time going back to thing so that's the for loop uh, 17 for loop so sir, just the, the, the purpose of a for loop is to do everything in one line that you would normally do in uh, a while. Just quicker. Three, C, three lines or four lines. C, C programmers were C designers were second type. Like it came after COBOL and PL1 and Fortran when it was hideous to type. So they said, we're going to create something so that you can be done quickly and write your thoughts. And that's what they did. That's why everything, it, you can write it in shorthand when we were young we actually had competitions to try to write the whole program in one line and you won't believe the crazy stuff we came up we had one huge line with a semicolon at the end that did something for us so you you can do that but it's not you're not supposed to do it too much just use the one that the the, the program provides so this is very normal Every, Every C programmer understands this, but if you start adding keep commas in here and keep going forward, they're going to say, why? Just write a loop and separate the line so I can read it. You don't want to purposefully make somebody confused. This doesn't make confusion, but if you have many stuff, then just write it in a separate thing in a while loop or a for loop, a simple for loop with a, with a body. Uh, are we okay with that? Uh, who was the person who asked? Somebody asked, so whoever is like told me, like we we just talked, so that's that's the point of it. Uh, now, um, uh, I'm sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, go Please. ahead. Um, so for that very simple um, for loop where you put whatever you want to execute in the change um, place, right? Um, when do you recommend doing that to not make it look very complicated? You mean to put com the commas over here, back to back, right over here? Um, yeah, or just whenever that you think have you have to look back twice to make sure you wrote it right. Okay. Okay. When you Thank look you. twice as your code, and it says, "Did I write that right?" That means stop. Make it clear. If okay. three seconds yep. passed, then you have to go back and check it. In three weeks, you have no idea what you have done. Easy. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Uh, all right. Um, so, uh, and the next thing is do while. So, as we mentioned in while loop, that uh, while loop is a while, and you can actually, uh, uh, what you may call it, um, write it any way you want. Uh, and there is another, and, and, it, and it may never happen. So, we actually wrote something like this. You wrote a is equal to minus 20. And we wrote it like this. If you want it to at least happen once before anything happens, if that's the case, you can use a do while. So do while is a while loop that happens at least once, which means if I just copy this one and put, because the condition is happening, it's like no brainer. The condition happens at the end. Obviously it's gonna happen only once. So you say do this while this condition, which means First, it's going to do it, then check the condition. Therefore, at top will never happen. Never happens. This one happens at least once. And when you are programming, you'll notice that you're going to be at the time that you say, I want this thing to happen at least once. As you see, just the minus 20 is printed and it stops. But this one doesn't. So do while when you want the condition to be done at the end and the action to happen at least once before it's checked, that's what you're doing. You can simulate this one by having a while loop by, by, by making the condition correct at the beginning once. But anyway, so this is what we have. So while, do while, do we understand what do while is good for? There is another time. Oh, actually, forget it. No, 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 no. Sorry, I forgot what I'm doing. Uh, there is nothing else. So, so um, 18 do while. So 
So we have the do while and what else do we have? While do while flags. Obvi uh, uh, oh. uh, when I write a program in repetitions, and this is uh, something that I always do, whenever you see, uh, and uh, I'm talking to Match that said, when is it too complicated when you're doing a for loop? Uh, it was you, Match, right? Uh, yes. Yes. So the conditions sometimes become hideous. Like when you are doing something, you want something to happen, and you want if this goes this and that goes that and that goes this and this goes this but if that done has and that in does have and that if you want to go a condition like this always use flag so whenever i have something that i have to think of hard before i decide what to do this is my immediate expression i simply say int uh, done is zero okay false okay then i'm gonna say while not done and i'll do whatever i need to do so all I need to do over here in my thing that whenever I am done, I set the done to true. And the condition is going to stop in the, next, in the next repetition. So remember, using flags is a very handy thing to do. Whenever you have many conditions to, met, to meet, especially user interfaces, this is the obvious thing in a user interface. Always user interfaces work like this. And then you have over here a switch. So user like this is standard user interface thing so you say user interface then in here you have uh, uh, some uh, PRN menu and uh, or select option and that select option function actually returns a selection and because you don't know what's gonna happen over there you do it like this then in here you are saying case one I don't know load file for example or uh, read something uh, read number if they select the read number and then break and then you write case two so so and then and then in here case two then if the value is something if if it's two and if something happens then something then in here you say done is one and then you don't need to worry about it because done became one in this break and default is whatever I don't know so so what ever okay so what I'm saying is that you write something like this and you don't need to worry about checking the condition and changing the condition all the way through but depending on whatever happens in each condition you set the value to done to true it means I'm done get out of the while loop and you're done so having flags very useful okay are we okay with this um professor i am um, i only tend to use flags in uh, such as you just said you know in complex conditions and in cascading menu programs is there any other use for flags i always started with a flag when i don't know what i'm about to write okay so I started with a flag, then I will say, oh my God, the flag that I use is only set at one place. If that's the case, remove the flag, make it the condition. But okay, when thank I, you. It's, a, it's a peace of mind before you want to begin. I know that I'm rep about to repeat something. I know it has to stop somewhere. I don't know the conditions yet, so I'm writing the program. So I do a flag, I do my program, and when it's finished, I'm going, oh, that flag wasn't necessary. I just change it. Usually I start with flag, honest. That's what I do. Yeah, if I want to do a for loop, do something 50 times, you don't have a flag. But when you have many conditions and you don't know how the condition is going to go, flag is your friend. Okay, so. Next thing I want to say is the two things in repetition, in, in repeating stuff, never ever use break or continue. Okay, I don't want to even mention, I don't want to mention their names. The two keywords, break or continue, break or continue, should never, never be used in a loop. Ever, ever. This, these essentially means go to. 
if you do a break it means halfway through your loop go to the end and then don't 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 buy it break the so essentially you are breaking the condition of the loop with a break very bad thing to do because your condition is not broken you broke it irregularly continue means ignore the rest and go back and and do the loop again again there is no case that a break cannot be fixed with a flag or a continue cannot fix with an if statement okay if there is if you are using break and continue it means don't do it this thing was abandoned 50 years ago 30 years ago when st structured programming came to the being writing it again is going back 30 years in programming it means you are beyond dinosaur you're those little microbes living in the ocean and haven't come to the uh, uh, dry land yet, yet don't use break and continue it's extremely uh, okay so I'm just gonna call this don't use break and continue. 20, no break. Oh, what did I do? <laughs> it came no C. Let me fix that. Mm, so I'm going to say 20. Let me fix 20. 20, no break or continue ever in a loop. And you open that program, you'll see it just says it in it. <laughs> okay, so that's it. So, so no break or loop in a in a program ever. Okay, remember that. Uh, uh, what is the next? About James nested selection. You know, this is not something that I need to explain. You in an if statement. You write an if statement, the first condition happens inside that condition, you check another condition. Write another if. Easy. Okay? Doesn't matter. You know all that, I don't need to explain. Loop in a loop, no problem. These are the things that you have to do through exercise. Indentation, uh, braces, comments. Um, Professor? Yes. Would you mind just going um like a little bit into the loop in a loop i found that a bit confusing okay um so you want to make five cakes yeah and each cake needs five layers yes you are looping in a loop so in a first loop you say make lay cake for i is equal to one i less than five you're making a cake inside the lake you say five I equals to one, two, three, create a layer. So each loop will do three inner loops based on what it is. Let's write an example for it. So let's say I want to draw a square, okay? With, I want to draw a square with uh, asterisks. So what I do to draw a square with the asterisk, how many lines I want in a square? Let's say I want five. So I'll go uh, I and J, so I'm gonna go four. I set to zero, I less than 10, so that's 10 lines, uh, and I uh, plus plus, that does it 10 times. So this is going to print 10 lines. Each line is going to have 30 asterisk in it, so I'm going to say 4, J set to zero, J less than, J less than 30 or 40, and J plus plus. Now in here I'm going to say put care asterisk. It would have been nice too. And then after every line, I want to go to new line. So what happens when the program is actually running, three years later, program is running, it does this for the first time, but and that is 40 times doing something. Okay? Right. Man, oh man. And what is the value of J27? Oh, we have to go. What is the value? 37, 38, 39, 40, it comes out, goes to new line, outer loop is gone, it goes back up, now the second loop is happening, I, is, I becomes 1, and then it continues for the second one. And therefore, when everything is done, I'm going to have 10 things happening 40 times each. Are we good with that? It was... Yes. Who was that? Yes. Oh, oh Maham. Oh, can, yeah. you, can you uh, pr pronounce your name? My apologies. Uh, yeah, Maham. Maham. Okay, so Maham. Yeah. 
All right. Thank you so much. No problem. So that's uh, Lupe. That's net again. Don't. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, I try to understand no, uh, no blanks and continues in the during the loops, but um, you are you try to understand what? One more time. Try to understand that um, black no blanks and uh, continues during the yes. uh, uh, in the loop. But I have hard time understanding how to fix it. So whenever you are saying if continue, find... so if you don't, you know how to fix it, think that they don't exist, then program. <laughs> That's how you do it. When you are writing a so break the statement, condition is wrong, no? when, you are, when you are writing a break statement, it means you want the condition to go false and the loop stops, correct? Yeah. So whatever was the reason that you came to break, it has to be added to the condition. Add a flag while not done. And set oh, the flag okay. to true. That's for your break. For continue, Thank you are you. saying you are saying whatever condition that you have that made it not to want to do the rest of the loop, make it an if statement. If condition, if not condition, then do this. Otherwise, skip it. It's an if statement. Mm -hmm. Easy. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Okay, so uh, what did I want to say? We are we are good. So that's the nested thing we want to talk about. Uh, where are we? Where are we? Yeah, style extremely important. If you are not a seasoned programmer, follow your prof style, and do it obsessively. When you are given the choice make the change to that style and always stick to it obsessively if you are having a curly bracket open at the beginning of everything and always do it even if it's one line and if you don't want to do it don't do it but you mean like always stick to the same style of the code if you don't then the person who wants and yourself when you want to follow the code you the it's already complicated if you don't have the indentation to, to show what belongs to what and you don't have the same process your eye cannot guess where the next statement is to read let me give you an example just after the class is over try what I'm gonna tell you try to walk to the wall 10 steps not too much but the rule is that do not have equal steps you're gonna see how difficult it is to be walk to walk don't take equal steps. Each step be, be, be in different size. You won't be able to halfway through gonna fall because you cannot concentrate. Oh, should I be bigger or smaller? You don't know. When you don't put proper indentation in your code, your eye, without you knowing, has to search to find where the first next thing begins. And that search is gonna make your brain tired without you knowing. So everything being organized, your eyes jump proper distances as you are going through your code therefore you can understand things better and you can be quicker so always 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 follow your uh, prof style so remember always indentation these days um, uh, uh, all the uh, IDEs provide that but one thing you need to do the uh, nemesis of good style is the tab character make sure any type of id any type of text editor you use make sure you go to the options and in the text editor options go to a place that they talk about tabs and make sure you say to insert spaces instead of tab to whatever you want. The reason is that if you if it inserts tabs, tabs in different languages in different uh, uh, text editors are it, are interpreted differently, and because of that, you move your code from platform A to platform B, and suddenly everything goes bananas. So always try to for all tabs in our languages always insert spaces. For me, a good number is three. 
because I'm teaching. Otherwise, I would have made probably make it two, depending on how much nested stuff I want to have. But three is a good number. And that's going to be the size of your tab. So what you see over here is not actually a tab. It's actually three spaces. And because of that, if I move it to another com com uh, uh, text editor, it will remain three spaces, not suddenly jump to eight or two or whatever the tab size is. So do not use tab character in your uh, programs, and you're going to be fine. So style is style. Testing and debugging techniques. Always insert, always insert testing statements wherever you have problem to see what the values are. These days, if especially if you're my student, because I, I do the programming as I am going through, I do it in class in front of your eyes. You see how I hover the mice mouse in front of like in above each thing and how I press F10. And I, as you see, I'm going step by step through the thing and I can see exactly what the value of each variable is by hovering. Or I look at the auto tab and it shows me how the values are changing as the program is running. So it helps you with debugging. But if you are working on a uh, environment that you don't have this facility, you can always insert test statements over there. One of the uh, easy ways of, uh, uh, one of the most common ways of inserting debug statements and then removing it is using the debug flag. And this is something that probably should not be taught in IPC 144, but because you are going to OP244, it's probably nice for you to know it. So you can actually say, for example, create a define thing you over here, say define, uh, call it deep like and and this is far that that is doing the buying i'm going to go fs debug okay so i'm going to define something like that and if i want debugging statements to be printed in here i'm going to say i'm going to put a compiler command and i'm going to say if defined fs debug If the fine FS debug, then I'm going to say printf new line printing. Okay. And I'll go to new line. So that becomes my debugging statement when I want to see if things are happening or not one by one. Okay. So if, if defined, not if not defined, if defined. Okay. And then if I run the program now, when the new line is getting printing, it's going to say new line printed, new line printed. As you see, debug statement is actually being displayed. If I want to remove those debugging statements, I don't have to remove it immediately. For now, I can just comment this until the execution is properly done. Now, if I do it like this, because FS debug is not defined anymore, this line will not get compiled and therefore the debugging statements are removed. And like this, I can actually insert debugging statements wherever I want to see what the values are and remove it whenever I want. And you can put this one in a header file of your application. So when you remove it, it's removed from everywhere. If it adds, if it adds it every, it's, it's going to add it everywhere. And it's very handy. And then before submission of your code, then you're going to go through all these debug statements and you remove it. Never leave it in your code, ever. Your Submission should always r have all the debugging statements removed. And that's one of the good ways to insert debugging statements to see what the values are. When you are doing an IDE, you can just execute it step by step. Click on debug. It tells you exactly start debugging, step into. Ste so step into essentially goes into a function, step over, runs the function as one program. So you don't have to, uh, so you, ca you, you can't, uh, so you won't actually uh, see it happening over and over. So for example, in here, I could have created the program like this, but I could have sim simply said over here, uh, void PRN line integer len. I could do it like this and have the, the line that is printed over here brought into another function and make that 40 over here len. And in here, I had integer j and remove it over here and simply say over here for i is equal to 1 to 40 simply over here I would say print line line of 30 this time okay 
and now my program runs the same way but it's actually printing the lines in 30. Now if I want to debug it I press F10 and I'll come through it. When I get over here and I, if I press F10 again it's going to jump over it which means it runs this line as one command and if I press it the whole thing is printed over here as you see then it goes to next but if I want to debug that one too I press F11 Pro when I press F11 it actually goes inside the function and starts printing it and if I'm saying okay it looks like it's printing okay I want to get out of it I don't know what is the keyboard for it just come to debug and you'll see over here step out is shift 11 so if I press shift 11 it completes the function and comes out so I'm gonna hold shift and press F11 and voila it runs the whole thing and comes out and I can continue debugging any way I want okay and this technique helps a lot for you to go through your program and see how it is run are we okay with this All right, so let's go back over here. That was debugging Schmalin. Go through, anyways, through with, uh, uh, with uh, work, with uh, experience comes uh, new ways of doing things. So it's a good idea to uh, 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 keep programming and then you're going to come up with your own style of debugging. But uh, those were my uh, uh, few advices for debugging and let me actually put that one under debugging so 22 debugging let's see arrays in C language how are they created uh, arrays are uh, essentially uh, let me just uh, check something give me two seconds give me two seconds give me a second consider this as like a, uh, a break you're not going anywhere don't go for a break but I want to check something before we continue give me a second I want to check something yes That's not much. No, that's not much. Um, let me try something here. Give me a second. Um, um, what is the name of oh Okay, so before do, I'm going to uh, do the arrays in a different way, okay? So I'm going to actually start talking about pointers first before we actually get into arrays. And then like that, I can teach the arrays much simpler, okay? I, can, I could go through the arrays and make it very easy and go th and teach it to you in IPC 144 way, but I rather first teach pointers and then talk about the arrays. Um, do we understand what I want to do? So I want to first teach pointers before I do anything. And uh, yeah, so let me see if I can actually find something that I don't have to write now. I just want to see if I can do something quick in here. Uh, where was it? Where was it?
I think I have it. Good. Give me a second. Okay, so I want you to completely reset your information about pointers now and assume that uh, you, have, you know nothing about pointers and please listen to me, okay? So that's what I want you to do. I want you to assume that you don't know what pointers are and uh, I am going to talk about it and, uh, and just listen to me and see... Let me take a look at this. Where is it? Okay. So let's see. what are pointers so so uh, first of all everybody's ready for this I want you to be alert and pay attention to me because this is an important thing that I want you to know and uh, Armando if you want to set 193 for pointers this is the one that we need to know okay so please uh, get ready for it are we are okay and ready All right, and Armando is not replying to my poll. So, are you there, Armando? <laughs> if you have volunteered to put the time, no, I am. I, I am here. I just have like a backup, so that's probably the one you're not getting. <laughs> okay, I just want to say if you are not here and you said you're going to put the time, no, no, I'm in trouble, man. I got it, I got it. I'll keep it. I'll keep it track. Give me track. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So, a pointer. So essentially, we said that we know what memory is, right? So we said that memory is essentially uh, um, a series of bytes that you have in your memory starts from zero and it keeps going up, 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 up until it reaches to the amount of money in your pocket that how big your memory is going to be. So it starts from zero and goes as much as it can. But uh, obviously, I'm, I'm halfway through the memory, but I'm using three digits only of the first three digits, so to refer to the address. So when I say address uh, 104, essentially what I mean over here is address 23,423,104. Okay, so when I say 104, that's what I mean. Are we okay with this? All right, so when you actually, when you actually... Uh, create a, a, a variable, let's say you call it, an int create an integer variable, uh, when you actually do it, what you see is that compiler takes a piece of memory, someplace takes four bytes and names it var. So when you actually, or you, if you want to do a double, it creates a double variable somewhere. Wherever the memory is available, it's going to create that piece of memory and put it over there. Now, when you set these things to values, when you say var is, for example, is equal to 98765, because it knows var is an integer, it puts the four bytes over there, overwrites those four bytes with the content of your integer value as binary and put it over there and when you actually say I want to put the dvar that is a double value to this value it takes that one and puts it right over there okay so that's essentially what it's going to do so it says so it knows you have eight bytes and it just puts it over there and that's it uh, are we okay with this So, uh, so are you on mute? Am I on mute? 
No, okay. can you hear me? One, two, three. Anything. I don't no, I, I put you on mute because your 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 uh sorry your <laughs> your uh, uh microphone was on. I was he could hear my own dings from the <laughs> from the thing and it was distracting, so I muted you. My apologies. Okay, so now I want to have a variable. So can you tell me what is the address of var v a r variable? in this uh, illustration. Quick, 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 quick. I love the fact that some people actually put a question mark at the end. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so, so holy schmoly, some people are actually putting the whole thing. So the address is 108, not 108 to 1012. So to 112, the address is the address of the beginning. So the compiler knows it starts 108, and because it's an integer, it knows it's going to cover four bytes. That's why we call that an address. So the address of var is 108, and what is the address of the var? 132, perfectly correct. So it's going to be 132, and because it's a double, compiler knows from 132, it has to go eight bytes further. Are we okay with this? All right. What if I want to have a variable to hold this number in here? So I want to have the variable 108 in here instead of, uh, uh, I want to keep that variable 108 and I want to keep that variable 132. But I, because these are not regular integers, these are integers that are supposed to hold the as address of other type things, I'm going to create a separate type for them and I'm going to call it a pointer. So essentially what I'm going to do is going to be pointer PTR and that's going to be a pointer that I'm going to have uh, in it. And in that pointer I'm going to put the address so essentially that pointer of mine that is PTR I'm going to put the address 102 in it so therefore PTR is now pointing to the address 102 which means so it says PTR is nothing but a variable but when I put 102 in it I mean that I want to actually put it in address 102 but of course I do not want to put address 102 I want to put it in address 108 because of that uh, I have to make sure that I make the pointer point to something that belongs to me. If I go to 102, I'm going to get segmentation fault. I'm out of the memory that I am. So in that pointer, I, I should point, I put actually 108, so it actually points to the place that I am in there. Obviously, you never know what is the address of a variable. That's why we have something that can extract the address of the variable out, and that's what, it, what, what we call that. We call that address of. So I can say PTR is equal to address of var, and that's very, very, very important to follow. Give me two seconds. Uh, please, uh, por favor, let me just do something in here. I'm trying to find something in here that I need to. Just a second. There we go. So, essentially, let me just check one more time. We are at this proper correct place. And I am in here perfectly correct. So, where am I? So, essentially, what I said is that if I have over here integer a, okay, if I have over here integer a as a variable, as I mentioned, okay, if I have over here integer a, okay, if I want to actually, if I want to actually create Oh, let me actually go back in here, go back in here, and I'm going to come back over here. My apologies. Let me go back in here. It's a little too early for that. So, so I'm going to put pointer address of, and I'm going to put address of var. So address of var goes to PTR. Therefore, I don't need to know what the address of a variable is. The address of will extract the address and give it to me. And I can do the exact, and, and 
and if I want to put something in the variable in here using its address, what I need to say is that the target of PTR, which is 108, will have the value 2345, and because PTR is a pointer, and I'm saying target of, the compiler knows where to put everything, and therefore the value of 2345 will actually go to the variable. Uh, and not the pointer because I'm saying target of PTR. If I wanted to put something in PTR, this is where I would put it. I don't want to. I want the uh, P target of PTR that is var to be replaced. That's why I put over here 2345. And therefore, if I print var after that, the outcome of that, the outcome of that uh, uh, printout in the output is going to be the value 2345. And, and if I actually print the target of PTR, I'm going to get the exact same result with absolutely no difference. But if I print the PTR itself, then what I'm going to receive is the actual address that is stored in the PTR. Are we okay with what you see on a screen? And take your time if you don't get it. This is all good and dandy, so let's try this for the double value. Oh, Osama, you said no. I was going to say, can you just like quickly repeat that? Okay, so for some unknown reason, because I lost my mind, I don't want to directly deal with variables. I want to have the address of the variable and deal with the variable with their address. Are we okay with that? So first, I want you to know what the objective is. So my objective is, because I'm nuts, I don't want to put stuff in the variable directly. I want to indirect put something in a variable using its address. Are we okay with our objective? Yeah. Okay. If I want to do that, I need to keep that address at some place. That's why I have to have the type called pointer, which means create a pointer, PTR, to be able to put an address in it. And I need to have some tool to extract the address out of the variable. So I can say PTR is set to address of var. Therefore, PTR will hold the address of variable. And therefore, I can use another tool to go to target of PTR and put something in it, which essentially means it goes to PTR, sees what is the address, it goes to that address and puts the value in the address and not the PTR itself. Are we okay with that, Osama? Yep. All right. So therefore, after that, if I print the variable, 2345 will be printed because that's what I put in there. If I say target of PTR, it's the same thing as var because target of PTR is var. And if I print PTR, instead of the value of var, the address of the variable will be printed, which is 108. Are we good with that, too, Osama? Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. So let's do try to do the same thing with the double, okay? So I'm going to say I have a PTR pointer PTR, and I'm going to put in PTR the address of double variable. So therefore, what's, what, what goes into PTR is 132, that is address of the double. Are we okay with this? Now, if I actually do that, and if I say target of PTR is equal to 2345 point something something something. If I actually want to do that, how does the compiler know what is sitting over here is actually 8 bytes? I didn't change anything. Pointer PTR and pointer PTR that held an int and pointer PTR that hold double, there is no signature here that tells me what is sitting at target of PTR is a double. Therefore, doing that is impossible. I cannot both use the pointer for an integer for a double because the target is different. I cannot, like if I, on an envelope, I only write an address, from that address you don't know what is sitting at a target. Is it a house? Or it's a huge complex building. You don't know what the target is. I have to tell you what is the type of the target so the pointer can keep the address of the target. So I'm going to say 132 is address of a double or 108 is an address of an integer. So we crave the pointer to actually know what is sitting at the target and not just to be some crazy thing sitting over there. Do we understand this? 
So pointers must have type. You can't just say pointer. You should say integer pointer PTR. So therefore, when you actually put the address of var into PTR, compiler can check it, say, yes, it is an address of an integer. You are putting it in an in a address of type integer, so we are good. Now you can actually put all the good stuff that you wanted to. And when you want to create a double pointer, you say double pointer DPTR, and that's exactly what's going to happen. So therefore, now if you actually want to set the target of DPTR to a value, you can actually do that because now from DVD, DPTR it knows the target is a double and therefore it can actually set it, print it, and get the access and do everything as it's done. Are we okay with this? So essentially what I meant was that if I actually wanted to see what is what is this in action? I sh if I have an integer var over here, okay, I, I literally, what I said was that I have an integer pointer, PTR, then I said PTR, PTR is set to address of, uh, address of var, and then after that, um, I could simply print, so I can say printf, and I could say over here percent %d, uh, and I could actually print the target of the target of PTR, or uh, yeah, and yeah, the target of PTR with a comma over here, obviously. The target of PTR, and that would actually result in a uh, printout of oh, sorry. I didn't set the value, <laughs> so I would I have to say target of PTR is set to two three four five. Sorry, and then I could print either var itself or the target of PTR. So I can say over here var. So if I would actually do it with var, and or I could say target of PTR. So if I printed these two, you would see that I would have two, three, four, five in both scenarios. And if I actually wanted to see where that uh, integer is sitting at, I can just print PTR, which is a pointer and is holding an address. But instead of percent D, I'm going to say percent U because I want it to be unsigned integer. So I'm just going to put a p I'm just going to print the PTR. And now we know that that integer is sitting in this address in memory. Are we okay with this? Well, sorry, I just had a question. Yes. I'm following along on Visual Studio. Um, so no, 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 I... don't, 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 don't. Who's that, Ricardo? Are you? Yeah. Do don't, don't. But don't, I follow pretty easily I, with I it. did some magic. That's why it's working. That's what I figured. You did yeah, something. Don't, with, don't, uh, yeah, I did some magic. Library. I'm going to show you the magic soon. Okay, don't worry about it. That's fine. <laughs> you're, following worry on, about it. you're following on Visual Studio and getting error messages everywhere, correct? No, 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 no. Just this one time, I swear to you. Okay, <laughs> okay, good. Okay. <laughs> okay, so so keep that in mind. Okay, so now that we have this. Excuse me, sir. Yes. Uh, I mean, I'm not used to this term, target of address. I know of. you are not you used. Use it. I know, Carmel. Wait for me. Okay. I just wrote the English meaning of those things. Bear with me for five more minutes, and everything's gonna go crystal clear. Okay. The only question that I have from you, Carmel, is that do you understand the English meaning of this? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> so bear with me. Deep breath. Bear with me. Okay, so now let's go back over here. But in C language, we said C people don't like to type much. Because of that, they replaced this pointer. So they said, whenever I want to say pointer, I'm going to put an asterisk instead. Therefore, integer pointer will change to integer asterisk PTR. You should never refer to this asterisk as a pointer because it means integer pointer. So all those asterisks should change to actually uh, 
uh, all those pointers should change to assay. So integer pointer PTR, double pointer P DPTR. Now, the address of is actually represented with ampersand. Therefore, address of in C is presented by ampersand. And now, I replace all the things with ampersand. So DPTR, ampersand DVR. But you should never call that ampersand. You should actually call that address of DPTR, DVP, DVA, DVAR? Yeah, DVAR, okay? So it should be called address of DVAR, double pointer. That's what you have to call. But if it wasn't confusing enough, sadly, they use the asterisk again, but this time for target of. So actually, for target of, they use asterisk too. But the way to recognize this is that the asterisk that means target of comes always before the name of a variable and not after a type. So when you look at it, it's going to look actually like this. This pointer is coming after a type, therefore it's integer pointer. This target of is coming before a pointer variable, therefore it's target of that. So that's how you recognize it. So how do we recognize the target of a pointer? It's easy. If the asterisk comes after a type, it means type pointer, like integer pointer, like double pointer, like employee pointer. If the asterisk comes in front of a variable as a unary operator, then it means target of, like a is equal to target of p, t is the target of t is equal to x, or A is equal to B multiplied to target of C. So that's how it's going to be, and so on and so forth. So how did I do the magic in my uh, Visual Studio? If you see, I actually hit over here my include file. Take a look at my include file over here. Look what I did. I added pointers.h. And what did I do in my pointers.h? I said, define target of to asterisk, define address of to ampersand, define pointer to asterisk. So wherever it wrote, I wrote over here pointer, it replaced it with asterisk. Remember search and replace? It did it. And that's why it works like that. You should name it properly, then you know what a pointer is. And there is no confusion. Don't give pointers extra credit. They are just variables to hold the addresses of the other variables. That's all. Are we okay with pointers? Beautiful. And now that we know what pointers are, we can actually understand really what arrays are. So, Arrays are actually implemented very nicely. Oh, sorry, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, to to like get the hang of it, can we for practice keep using like the way you did? It with, like, <laughs> no, 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 no. Just name it properly. Just remember so just to never say. Rem no, remember okay. to never say PTR is equal to ampersand back. Just name it properly, and it's gonna make sense. Okay. So Thanks. remember asterisk after type. So essentially, this is going, let me just put this back, because if anybody opens this and take a look at it, they're going to go bananas. So this is essentially asterisk, integer pointer. This is uh, ampersand. This is target of PTR. And this is target of PTR. Yeah, you, I don't know. I, I wouldn't do this, because later on, you're going to start putting theses in parentheses and stuff, and go. that's when it's going to go bananas. Okay? So, so I'm just going to comment this for you to, to know that that's what it means. And the define statements are in pointer.h. Take a look at it, okay? So just um, so you know that pointer over here is pointer.h, and it's included pointers.h that is actually included over there. Okay, so that's that. Let's actually put pointers over here, 23. We are getting close to the end of our review, hopefully. Uh, so um, now let me actually talk about, let me actually talk about pointers and arrays and try to understand actually 
what arrays are really in reality okay so when we talked about so so now we want to learn what arrays are again we're going to go back to our memory with arrays arrays are placed in memory too so we, we said that when you actually we said that when you actually create a single variable that single variable goes into memory then you can create a pointer to it and you can make the pointer point to that single variable and therefore you can actually refer to it and do whatever you want to do with it are we are okay with that right remember this from pointers are we okay with this <coughs> So what happens when you actually create an array? If you know pointers first, arrays actually not only become easy to understand, but also you'll, you'll know what's happening in the guts of the system when you're dealing with an array. When you create an array, say integer AR5, five integers back to back are sitting in memory. So from address 108, the other one is 112, then 116, then 120, and then 125. 125? No, something is wrong. 24. Oh, I put. A, I made a mistake. <laughs> this is not 125. <laughs> oh, I made a mistake. I have to fix this. This is not 125. Sorry. This another thing is supposed to be here. There, there is no 124 here. Why did I do this? This is not 125. This is this is one. I made a mistake. Sorry. Whoops. Yeah. So this is 124. So the, the last address is wrong. I have to fix this. Uh, let me. Can I edit this? Let me see if I can edit this. Yes, I can edit it. Give me two seconds. Let me. Wow. Then I have to edit everything after. Holy schmoly! I'll fix that later. But what I'm saying, what was, what I was saying is that uh, this is not. This is not 125. Oh, this is 124. Yeah, I, I marked it twice. I don't know why I did that, <laughs> and I did that for a long time. I'm gonna fix that uh, f and then post it. But anyways, it's like that in memory. So it sits back to back in memory. So when you write integer AR5, that's how it happens. And when you say AR3 is 2345, it says 0, 1, 2, 3, and it puts it in a third one that is the address of 120. And that's how arrays work. So essentially you say integer AR5, five integers are created from A0 to A4, because indexes in C language starts from zero. We have no idea of why, but we're going to understand in two seconds why so first one is zero and then one two so like this you don't have to create five integers you can create uh, w separately you can integer create five integers in one shot are we okay with this perfect but what happens really in uh when you are actually creating uh, an array of five integers. In reality, behind the scene, it's something like this. When you actually create integer AR5, it's not only five integers. It's five integers and one pointer. So one pointer will get crea created over here, and that one pointer will hold the address of the beginning of the array. Therefore, when you say AR0, you are essentially saying from the address of 104 goes 0 bytes further, which means 108 itself. So the target is that one. So essentially, if I say target of AR is equal to 2345, it's the exact same thing as if I want to say uh, the, the AR, uh, uh, it's as if I want to say AR0 is equal to 2345. And when I say AR2 is uh, 444, four, four, what happens is that it adds 2 to the address 108, but because 2 is address of integer, 2 multiplied by 4 is 8, so it adds 8, add 8 addresses over there. It goes to 116, therefore it's going to put it in that one. And that essentially means the same thing if you create a pointer. So you can simply say target of point A A R plus two five five five, then it's gonna replace it with five five five. So arrays are nothing but a pointer pointing to begin of 
beginning of series of integers instead of one but because that damn asterisk was so difficult they say the heck with that we're gonna create a new sign for it and that new thing that we create is actually uh, the index operator so essentially if I go back to my pointer that I created in here with a single thing let me just uh, uh, go save this and go to the new one so I want to copy this so essentially what I was saying was if in here I actually have my values like this which you know what it is we could actually instead of printf target of ptr i could say from the ptr whoops sorry 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 from the ptr address i could go say go zero bytes further so these two statements are equal and that's what arrays are so if i run the program now you will see that it's going to be two, three, four, five. This, because I did it manually, it's as if I have an array of one integer. Because what it looks like, I first created an integer. That's my integer var. Then I created a pointer for that one. And that pointer of mine is actually PTR that is pointing to the beginning of var. Whoops, not like that. That is pointing to the beginning of var. So either I can say target of, and let me just write the name so we can actually see what we are doing. So this is over here, PTR, and this is in here is var. So this is var. So when I say target of PTR printed, it's var. When I say PTR zero, it means from the address PTR goes zero uh, integers further, and that means this one. So to kind of make this thing work a little differently what I can do is this instead of having this var over here like this I can actually do it like this now take a look um, let me just uh, stop the drawing over here and see what I'm gonna do I'm gonna say over here integer var this time I'm gonna go five so I have five variable and in here, instead of saying PTR is equal to address of var, because I know var is a pointer pointing to the beginning, I simply say PTR is equal to var. And if I say target of that one, everything else will work perfectly. The only difference is that now I actually have four variables over here. One, two, three, four, and five. But the rest is exactly the same, and I have now two pointers pointing to them, not only one. One is var. Do we have an eraser here? No, they, they don't allow me to erase. I wish I could erase, but I can't. Anyways, so, so that is not var anymore. This is not var anymore. This thing is one click behind. When I click, yeah, I have to double click to actually say, so this var is not here, and this is now called var. So now my code can actually be written like this. I can write PTR0, and everything like that is going to get printed perfectly. Or I can, what I can do is to say, I can say uh, var3, is set to two, two, three, four, and in printout, I can actually do it like this. So this is var three. But in var three, instead, I can say ptr three, and it will still work perfectly because they are interchangeable. It's like one snake with two heads over here. I and as you see, pointers and uh, arrays can be used interchangeably with absolutely no difference they are all the same and equal as we go through it so arrays are essentially nothing but uh, uh, a pointer pointing to many uh, variables instead of only one and that's why when we actually write a function so in here I'm gonna write 23 pointers 
and arrays. And that's why uh, when you write a function, uh, void foo, and in here you say integer ar, and you just leave it empty like that, and you say something like for, say int i set to 0, i less than 3, and i plus plus, i plus plus, and you say ar i, is set to, I don't know, um, um, 100 plus i. If I do something like this, now if I actually call foo over here and I pass var to it, what's going to happen is this. Because in here, the array that is passed has no body, essentially in function foo, you are creating yet another variable. And that variable of you is called AR and that AR of yours is actually pointing to the beginning of the address too. So this function that you actually created when you pass AR to it you will see that it's going to actually change the whole uh, uh, first th three elements of the array and just to uh, initialize the values of the array in here I'm gonna put thousand 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and 5,000 here. And I can even create another function. I'm going to call it PR and AR. And in here, I'm going to use the exact same code just to print it out. I'm lazy. Don't want to write another for loop. So in here, I'm going to have constant because I don't want it to change. Integer AR. And I'm going to have int size to get the size of the array. And simply, I'm going to go from 0 going up to size. And I'm going to print the AR. So I'm going to say printf percent %d and a space. And I'm going to put AR over here. And go to new line afterwards. Put char backslash n. Make the code a little smaller. So if I now come over here, right at the beginning, I can actually say over here, uh, PRNAR, put var in here, and size 5. So that's going to show it at the beginning. And when I come over here right before foo, I'm going to print it one more time. And after foo, I'm going to print it even one more time. And you will see that when I run the program, nothing's going to change because I modified the old program by mistake not the one new one let me copy it sorry about that i i modified the old program copy let me just go back here program.c this is the one that i had to have and let's put this one back where it was sorry about that save it close one more time. Okay, now if I run this, you will see that, oh, I have build errors. What is the build error over here saying? Requires an argument of type int. Oh, yes. So this is uh, var zero. Uh, this is correct. Was that the error? What is next? Formatting u requires argument of that. That's, that's a warning. It doesn't matter. One unresolved statement. What's going on? Uh, On line 12, the oh, uh, spelling of put characters. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank now. you, put care, thank you. <laughs> okay, so run it one more time, and this is what we are going to take. Thank you very much. So now if I take a look at it, you will see that's why when you actually pass a... a a point, uh, uh, an array to a function, and you change the array in there, the source changes because no new array is created. You are just passing the name that is a pointer to an array, and it acts like a pointer that is, and therefore the target is changed, not the array, and we have uh, arrays created and worked like that. Are we okay with this? And that's simply our race. And remember, 
when we are talking about strings, C strings, series strings are simply uh, uh, character arrays that we come to the agreement to put a null at the end of the data in the character in the character array. So what is a character string in C language? It's a character array with following the standard of ending the data with a zero. Do we understand what a string is? And now you understand why you actually, when you call scanf, why you have to put ampersand in front of name of every variable, but when you actually pass a string, you don't need to put an ampersand, you just put the name of the array, a name of the string. Why? Because it's an array, the name goes in, so it knows where the target is. But the other ones, you have to actually pass the address so the target is visible and available. So, uh, and this one is going to be arrays24 arrays.c okay and we don't need the strong anymore Whew. I'm feeling um, I've heated up so <laughs> um, let's see if it's a long time that I'm like five hours we're talking back to back but it's okay all right so let's go back I want to finish it if I don't want to uh, have another break. I want to finish it. Go back to my family because they gave me some dirty looks when I get down when I got down there. It's it's Sunday. <laughs> anyway, so structures. So what is structure over here? Structure is essentially when you want to have uh, um, um, pack few things in a package. Remember, I told you you can never return anything from a function uh, more than one thing from a function. Uh, and the illusion of passing stuff back through the arguments is literally passing the address of a variable. So you are passing something by value, which is the address. The address are passed to the function, and for, therefore function knows where the target is and changes the stuff remotely. So again, nothing is passed. So how can we actually pass more than one thing out of a function? How can we make a function return more than one thing out? Um, how could I do that? Uh, the answer is packet in a structure. So a structure is essentially a package of five, six different, whatever different uh, types together, um, packaged as one. So if you want to put things together and refer to it together at the same time, we call that as a, that, that a structure and as simple as that. So it, there is nothing hidden behind it. Again, don't give it extra credit and treat it as is. So if I actually say, for example, uh, want to have uh, I want to have a, a, a student, I'm going to create a struct uh, I'm going to call it student, so I can now pack things, all the things that a student was supposed to have. So in here I'm going to say a character name, let's say that student has a name, that's beautiful. A student will have uh, a GPA and that's going to be a float. Uh, that is going to be the GPA that I'm going to hold and it's going to have an integer for the student number. And now I have a struct student that I can deal with whenever I want to create a student. So now this struct student becomes a new type from now on. As how did you, as if you could return an integer. So if I could have int get int to, re to get an integer from the, from the, entry from user and return it, I can do the exact same thing with the student. So I can say now struct student get student. So if I want to do something like this, it's going to happen very easily and I can really, really do it. So how do I do it? I simply create a student, struct student, ST. Now I have a package of that student created. So in here now I'm going to say printf name and I'm going to get the name. Then, then I want to get the student number and then I want to get the GPA. So in here I'm going to say scanf uh, percent up to 
up to up to where is up to new line up to new line and I'm gonna put it in the student how do I access the properties the properties inside the student with a dot dot single dot in C++ is like apostrophe s in English so I want to put ST's name so in here I'm gonna put ST's name that apostrophe so it means name of ST in here I want to uh, I want to read the student number I'm gonna say scanf percent D I want to read the student number so in here I'm gonna say ST dot student number but I have to put an ampersand beside it to become address of student number so I add an address the ampersand no sweat so address of ST student number and when I want to get the GPF GPA uh, I can do the exact same thing so in here I'm gonna put uh, LF uh, as oh, um, F F and in here I'm gonna say uh, students the GPA so I'm gonna receive the GPA of the student and then at the end I'm gonna say return ST so now in here I can have student again I didn't return three things I returned one pack that one pack held lots of stuff in it so I can say uh, struct student it's actually creating a struct for me struct student uh, the student now I can say the student is equal to get student so that's gonna receive a student and then I want to print the student so I'm gonna say print student and I'm gonna pass the student to it and it's gonna print the student so uh, to print the student uh, I'm gonna just copy this paste it it's void it doesn't receive anything so it's void it's it doesn't return anything but it's gonna receive the student so I'm gonna say that one and ST so in here I'm gonna say name and I'm gonna put percent s and show the student name and go to new line so that's name dot name and then I want to put the student number so I show the student number percent D new line and that's the student number and I want to show the GPA so I'm gonna go percent uh, point one LF sorry F and in here I'm gonna print sd.gpa and that's gonna print my uh, uh, my student so now I packed everything and passed it so my program now receives a student and has lots of errors what is the error in here error is get student function returning a value oh <laughs> yeah sorry I, I I forgot to remove that let's do it one more time what is the error now Oh, um, this you is, have this is to get student function. Yeah. Get student I, I'm, I'm getting tired. Student. Don't worry about it. My brain is not working a little bit. It's like a uh, thing. Oh, still problem. What is that one? Uh, is required called to printf actual yada yada printf. What am I missing in here? What was the error? It says when integer is required in call integer pointer what's going on here so st Am I your mis screen the struct student is highlighted i don't know why though no, uh, let me just see. Uh, on line 10 on line 10 no that's because i didn't initialize it it's blank so st comes here prints st name i'm making some stupid mistake somewhere I don't know what it is. Printf, printf, print. Seriously? Um, okay. Non integer parameter, yada. An integer. Sorry. Uh, line 20, you read, read definition. Is oh, shoot, key. shoot. Why am I doing it twice? <laughs> I, I don't know if that's the problem, but we'll find out. 
yeah anyways <laughs> sorry i cut i tried to copy and paste it to be quick i screwed everything up anyways name is fred soleil uh student number is one two three four five six seven eight nine i don't know if that fits in an integer but we'll find out and gpa is 3.5 and that's the student that it receives and everything looks beautiful and dandy so that's how structures work and you can treat this like any other variable that you have done create arrays out of create pointers to and so on and so forth that brings us to the next thing when you pass around the student you are passing 51 plus 4 plus 4 16 so you uh, plus 4 8 so you are passing 59 characters back and forth that's very expensive because of that fact usually uh, structures are not let me just put 25 over here struct let's see structures are usually not are not passed around by values so when you actually want to receive a student get student they don't return it what they do they say instead get the address of the student in here because we know address is only four bytes so only the address is going to be passed student pointer st okay st st and then when you are passing the the address obviously instead of a dot you have to use an arrow remember pointers use arrows so when you have a pointer you have to use an arrow with uh the the structure everything else is the same so now when you do something like this you're essentially passing passing where the where the uh st student is so only four bytes will be passed and not 59 and even when you are passing to print it make this one a pointer but make sure that it cannot be changed because its job is to only print so you pass set it as constant and you pass it forward and again it's going to be the exact same thing and therefore now this code is much more efficient and only eight bytes of information are passed back and forth and not much uh garbage is passed but so what we do what we need to actually pass the address of the student in here and address of the student over here too and it works the exact same way no difference but the difference is that it is faster because not much of uh, information are passed are passed over here oh i forgot to remove that there you go so now if i run it fred soleil one two three four five six seven eight nine and gpa is 2.4 and that's what's going to come up it works the exact same way but much more efficient in here only eight bytes of information are passed through in the previous one they are the total of 58 plus 58 that is uh, 116 bytes passed passed back and forth so in here for the same thing to for to accomplish the same thing i am passing 100 and uh, 16 bytes back and forth in here actually it's much more than that size of the structure is bigger than that you're gonna find that in OP345 but just for you to know but the minimum is what I just told you and and this one doesn't have that problem because only the address this one doesn't have that problem because only the address is passed back and forth and that is just four bytes over here and four bytes over here in total of eight bytes which makes it extremely faster so in here, I'm going to say 26. Struct.c. And ladies and gentlemen, that's structure. So again, do I need to teach you structures and arrays? No. It's the same thing as an integer array. It's just 20. Like if I want, like what happened if I had over here 20 students? Nothing. Like I'm going to make it 3, not 20. Then what would I do? easy just right over here four it's going to be integer i four i set to zero i less than three and i plus plus it works the exact same way that you did with the other one but the difference is that instead of get student you're going to pass get student i again when you learn something in the language extend it to other things and get direct conclusion of what you see and the answer is exactly the same 90% of the time your guess is correct and if it's not you get an error message and you fix it so now I have three students as an array of three uh, three students back to back and this prevents 
parallel arrays. If in old C's, when you don't know structures, you wanted to have three students, you had to have a two-dimensional array for name, three names, three GPAs, three student numbers. Instead, you are having three packs now, and when you run it, it works the exact same way. It reads the first one, second one, I'm not going to waste your time. You call out, run it later, and it's going to receive three students now. Uh, so in here, just to make it, um, I'm going to say over here, printf student number percent d in here i'm going to say i plus one so kind of show the information of the so so we know that the, so when you are receiving the student it's actually student number one that is being entered and number two three and you can go through it like that so that's that so and this is an array of, and if you pass the address of array of a student array of student to a function so I can you can do it the same same thing it doesn't make any difference it works the exact same way so in here instead of having uh, get student I can have another function and I call that function I can call that function get students do I need to pass any other type of pointer no because we know arrays are pointers that begin point to the beginning of an array of anything three students in memory now all I need to do is to actually put this uh, function right in here now I, I'm receiving three students and I, in here I can say integer size and in, instead of three I can put over here size and instead of the ST I can put ST and now I have an array of students pass and it gets three of them in a function and instead of this I can actually say instead of this I can actually say get students and pass the student over here to it and put over here size 3 and now I'm receiving three students they are all the same with absolutely no difference and it's gonna work exactly the same with three students being added what mistake did I make redefinition of get student why redefinition of get student Oh, sorry. It's you. I, I need a prototype for this because it comes at the bottom. So um, let me put this at the top. Because it comes at the bottom, it won't recognize it. I have to put it at the top. So get students over here knows what it is. So if I run it now, probably it's going to be okay. Yeah. So in here, Fred, Fred Soleil. And one, two, three, four. And 1.2. That's student number one. Oh. <laughs> because the other one has a, a new line this didn't work I had to have a flush keyboard now the program is getting more complicated so I have to do a flush keyboard now when I actually receive it so now after each uh, after the end of entry is done I have to flush the keyboard so in here I'm gonna say void flush key in here I'm gonna say while get care not equal backslash n and that will be the flush key so I'm gonna after getting the uh, GPA I'm gonna say flush key to make sure everything is good the other ones I don't need to flush but this one I think I do I think it's gonna work now so Fred uh, one two three um, 2.3 and now it gets the next one for dude and this one is three four five six and uh, three point five and he who and it's gonna be this and it's gonna be this and I have my three students and this didn't work for some reason I have to find out why why didn't they get those it is not printing it properly because you um, oh I put the address over here. I put no that's correct because what Oh, I put three over I think here. It's no, I put three. I put. I should have put I. <laughs> I put three. It printed something that is not there because three is out of the bound. Trust me, you run it, it's going to be good. <laughs> this one is going to be good. <laughs> you, you, let me run it one more time to make sure I'm not making any boo-boos. See, as I'm testing, it's got to be shorter and shorter. A, three, and three. B, four, and four. And C is uh, three and three. So there you go. <laughs> now they are there. Anyways, my apologies, that's three over here that was supposed to get printed. Anyway, so that's structures and arrays. So 27, struct and arrays. 
c and that's good to go let me see if i yeah i think that's the other one is correct all right uh, are we good down to this point are we okay so to tell you down to this point you are okay for op244 i'm just going to see what else is is left in here declaration alkyl anyway so in a module when you are doing a module remember always the structure has to be in a, you in the first workshop you're going to learn that the structure has to always be in a header file so you can reuse it and you put the compilation safeguards and everything member access and all these stuff we have done it functions you know i started with functions but that's why we don't need to talk about it i always believe c language should start with function not at the end pointers we talked about it arrays and structures we talked about it input functions what does it mean into it what do you mean get character clearing the buffer oh yeah i just did it right now um remember whenever you are writing something anything that you enter into the keyboard ends with a backslash n a new line and usually new line is the termination therefore everything before new line goes to the function that reads the new line stays in the keyboard you need to flush it if the next one is supposed to read it keep that in mind Uh, these are not something that I'm going to go through. Please just read it to yourself quickly. Uh, these are uh, like what to get and how conversion variables and how to convert them and print them. Plain Sir, I had, I had a question if I yes. can ask. Please, you know. please go ahead. I'm going into the second week of OPP. Uh, are we going to be talking about syntax similarities and differences between C and C++? As you go and through, you're going to see it. So we're not going to specifically say what is the difference, but there is no syntax difference between C and C++. Yeah, I was just, I was just wondering. C and C++ are identical with syntax. Again. Yeah, but I, was just, I was just looking at like, uh, especially like uh, output functions and using format specifiers. And I was like, can you use format specifiers like we do in C that we in, in C++? In an object oriented way, of course. Okay, let, I was let the time come. We have a, a week for that in. in Don't worry, I'm patient. So the, the <laughs> thing is that, the thing is that, I'm just explaining what's going on. The thing is that, again, if you listen to the first lecture of my object orientation, uh, I said that in C language, you have the functionality, you pass things to functions. In C++, you have the things, you ask the things to do something for you. The functionality of anything is within it. Okay? Um, listen to the first uh, lecture that I had um, and I post all my recordings if you're not my student you're welcome to see it and you're welcome to attend all my classes if you go to the notes you'll see that I post the link every day so you can get in it there is no problem with it but what I'm saying is that it is done in an object-oriented way uh, explaining it over here doesn't make sense because it's a review of 144 and 100 but when you get to it you'll see everything is done by passing values from object to object and each object handles what to do with it and we'll come to it soon. It's done in an object-oriented way. Okay, thank you. Uh, no problem. And the output over here again, so, and, and make sure that you go through files. Those are important. And files and everything are done in object-oriented way. It's very simple. Library functions. Yeah, these are the things that you have to go through it yourself again. Random numbers, these are functionalities. This has nothing to do with C language by itself. And if we are going through any logic or anything coming from here, like talking about random number generators and things like that, we just go through them quickly and you'll be fine. And if we refer to it, probably we're going to have a link for you to go through it and see it. Text files, um, it, they have no, there are no difference between a text file and keyboard. It's identical. Essentially, every single thing that you are doing is actually done with a file, not with uh, a, a file called standard input output. So, if I actually, if I actually come over here and write the exact same program, I can have all my printf's and scanf's write as fprintf and fscanf. The difference is that fprintf 
prints on standard output file and scanf reads from standard input standard out standard in again standard out and standard in so it's the same no difference if you run it it works the exact same way anything you print anything you do works exactly like a file but the difference is that these two files are always open your keyboard standard input is always open ready for you to read from your monitor your terminal is always for you ready to open the only difference is that with files you need to open the place you want to write into or open the place that you want to read from it's just easier than keyboard and monitor why because reading from a file you don't have the stupid user sitting over there keep entering wrong information you look at the format of the file you know exactly what it is you write your scanfs accordingly the only difference is that you have to open the file that's all there is absolutely no difference so to convert this thing to read the students from the file is as easy as knowing what the student file is so all I need to do is to create my student file new item let's say I, I need to have a text file in here so I'm gonna call it st.txt and let's say I have over here Fred Soleil slash student number and then GPA so I'll do it like this and I write and I so these are my so for ah, at, anyways I'm gonna just put one two three four so these are the five thing that we have and I'm gonna have over here one two three four five and in here it's gonna be uh, a one two three I cannot have four point four four something and three point four so this is my file and I have and when I look at it I'll see okay name comma student number comma GPA new line that's what I have so I can s simply write it accordingly very simple very straightforward so first of all let me just put it like this I'm gonna write over here 28 I'm gonna say file std in s std out dot c so if I come over here and try to read this from file convert the same thing get student like that to actually read from file all I need to do is to have the file open so I need to have the file so I'm gonna say over here file file FPTR uh, and I'm gonna call it st.txt and in here I'm gonna open it for read okay and if you want to put it in, a, in another file you can actually oh, 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 oh sorry 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 and you can say uh, and then um, you can have another file for output let's say let's say I have it like this out FPTR and this one's gonna say F open uh, and FPTR is equal to F open that opens the first one and the second one is going to be out for writing so I'm going to say F out FPTR is opening for writing writing and I'm going to call it st out.txt so that's it and I have to make sure that I close it when I'm done so I'm going to say FPT uh, close F close FPTR and F close out FPTR okay now what I need to do is to pass this file pointer to tell them where to, where you are going to write it so I'm going to pass the file pointer to this uh, files that I have so in here I'm going to say uh, file let's call it file pointer and I'm going to say F so in here is just F F F and F comma F comma F comma so that's gonna be st print student and in here I'm gonna pass the out FPTR so it's printing into that file and then from in PTR which one is it so I am uh, I'm doing get students 
So get students in here. I'm going to have the exact same thing over here. Copy. So get students. We're going to get a file. And get student is going to get the file too. So let's add these two over here. That's a file and a file. Okay. So no need to prompt because I don't have any live human beings sitting over there. It's just me and me. Okay. So I'm saying instead of saying up to backslash in, I'm going to say up to comma. And it's going to be F, 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 comma, F, comma. So I'm reading from a file, F, comma. And I'm saying uh, read up to comma. And in here, I'm going to say F, scan F, read, and then skip the, skip the uh, comma. So it's going to skip the comma. And in here, I can actually do backslash in, but this flush will work too. I'm going to... I don't need to flush the key over here. Instead, I'm just going to say uh, uh, skip the backslash in. And there you go. So it reads one by one because there is no person typing stupid stuff that I'm saying wipe out the key. I know it's and a new line is going to come after. And if it didn't come, I'm going to tell the person who's writing the file to fix your data file. It's not right. Um, so that's getting the student from the data file and get all the students from data file. I just passed that F thingy over here. Uh, and I don't even need to mention to anyone how many or when, because it's a file. I'm just going to say F. So now it's reading it from a file. And I need to come over here and just pass the file over here. And hopefully everything's going to work. So, oh, actually, uh, sorry, uh, FPTR. FPTR. And to make sure these files exist before or it's successful if they opening it, what you need to do is say if FPTR not equal to null, but we know if it's zero, it's false. And if it's non-zero, it's an address, it's true. Anything other than zero is true. I can just simply remove that and say if FPTR and out FPTR, FPTR. It means if both of these things open correctly, do the input output and close them. Otherwise, don't do anything. Actually, this is wrong because uh, I have to do it separately to make sure. Because uh, this close, uh, some of them may be, one of them is successful, the other one is not. It's going to fail. So I have to bring it over here and in here say, if FPTR is open, close it. If out FPTR is open, close them. So it's going to close them out FPTR. Then I'm going to say close them. So let's walk through it and see if it works or not. I'm going to start. I have two files. Let's actually uh, put this, uh, put uh, it as, uh, separated in two sections. All right. So that's that. So it's going to